Hello everybody, I'm your host Howell Curtis and I'd like to welcome you to The Space Industry by SatSearch, where we share stories about the companies taking us into orbit. In this podcast, we delve into the opinions and expertise of the people behind the commercial space organizations of today who could become the household names of tomorrow. Before we get started with the episode, remember you can find out more information about the suppliers, products and innovations that are mentioned in this discussion on the global marketplace for space at satsearch.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of the Space Industry Podcast. Thank you very much for spending time with us today. Now, I'm joined today by Joshua Weston, CEO of Spaceforge, and Lloyd Damp, the CEO of Southern Launch. And we're going to be talking a little bit about different aspects of the space industry that are emerging emerging concepts, but are, but are not as far away as perhaps you might think. This Specifically, the idea of facilitating the launch and the eventual return of materials from space. Quite a complex topic, and it's great to have both uh, both of you guys here today to talk about this. So, um, yeah, just to, to say hello to you both, and thank you very much for joining us today. Excellent. Thanks for having us. And I've got a number of questions for you both, as I mentioned, and I think some of them overlap, but others are probably more about your individual areas of operation. But before I really get into those, and we can talk about this, the topic that I mentioned at the start, perhaps you can set the scene a little bit by introducing yourself and and your companies, and then explaining a bit about your new collaboration, which is the context I think the audience needs to explain why you're appearing today together. Josh, if you'd you'd like to go first, then perhaps that'd be useful. Yeah, of course. So thanks thanks for having me. I'm Josh Weston. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Spaceforge. Spaceforge is really an advanced materials company. But our edge is that we happen to produce those materials in space. The benefit of doing so are effectively that you can create, at least in our market, next generation semiconductors in space, which when returned to Earth, really enable a leapfrog in how we interact with high value infrastructure. So much so that even after going to space, we can reduce energy use by more than 60%. Uh, And we've developed a vehicle, the Forge Star, to be able to bring those back. Excellent. Thank you. And, uh, And Light, could you introduce Southern Launch? Yeah, no, thanks so much for having us on the podcast today. So yeah, Lloyd, I'm the CEO of Southern Launch. We are a spaceport operator, but we are very unique in that we have both an orbital and a suborbital range. The suborbital range also supports the return of objects of which Space Forge will be the first object to, to land back here into Australia. The We're quite unique in that Australia is very open and barren, you could say, and it supports these types of re-entries, a safe re-entry of vehicles into unpopulated areas. And we do that in a close concert, you could say, with the local traditional owners and all the different Australian, both state and federal regulatory bodies. So it's a very interesting area for Australia. Australia was, a, a, from memory, the third country to support the launch of an orbital or an object into orbit back in the late 60s and 70s. And this is a re-emergence of a vibrant space industry and now into this country. So it's exciting times. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, we can get into some of these topics in more detail. And obviously to all of you listening, whether you're regular listeners or new, I'm your host, Hal Curtis from Satsuch. And just to explain about the company, Spaceforge is based in, headquartered in Wales, just down, sunny Wales, just down the road from me. And as, as Lloyd mentioned, uh, Southern Launch is headquartered in the actually sunny Adelaide in Australia. We're, we're right across the world on today's podcast. Okay. My first question really is to Josh. So Spaceforge has ambitions to provide what I've seen you guys describe as microgravity as a service. This is reliable access to space and importantly, the safe return of materials, the safe and consistent return of materials, which have been tested, altered, or even potentially made in orbit. The launch and deployment aspects of this are more well understood and is a big area of conversation and investment and lots of ongoing activity in that space around the world. And then obviously the in-space experimentation or the manufacturing processes that might be used will depend on the application of the materials in each mission. And I'm sure you're hoping and planning for different business models and concepts to emerge in that area and working on some of those yourself. But I wondered if you could give the audience more specifically a description of how the technologies that intend to be used to return the materials to Earth work or hopefully will work. Yeah, of course. Our... 
Return technology is probably best described as commercially novel as opposed to entirely technologically novel. Okay. The way that it works, it's called Pridwin. It's named after the mythical shield of King Arthur. And I'm told also loosely translates into spider in Welsh, which I think is also quite important because the way that it looks can lend itself to perhaps a web. The way that this technology works is, to date, most re-entry technologies have been what we know as ablative. That's the bell-shaped capsule that you'll be familiar with, they have a SpaceX Dragon, Russian Soyuz, Chinese re-entry vehicles, and so forth. And basically, the way that they work is they sacrifice material. They burn it off into the atmosphere. Nobody really knows what happens to it. They hope it just gets dispersed as heat. Probably some nasties gets left somewhere, and then it crashes into the ocean or on into a desert and maybe pops out a few parachutes along the way. It's not reusable. Astronauts describe it as a car crash when participating in it. And some of our customers have lost experiments in that final microsecond of impact. The way that we've developed Pridwin is to be a radiative re-entry technology. So rather than sacrificing material off, we actually deploy something which looks a bit like an upside down umbrella. I describe it as Mary Poppins from space that effectively allows us to float back from orbit to the ground. So we land with only roughly about 1% of the comparable kinetic energy to something like the Russian Soyuz. And its shape allows it to ma maintain aerostability, allows it to radiate the heat away into space so that we don't have to absorb anything into the platform, and also acts really as a, I would probably describe it as a semi-rigid parachute which means that we don't require any other high storage, high pressure gas storage systems or anything else and extra drogues and parachutes as well. So it's really a one-stop shop for our entire re-entry operation. Fantastic. Prodwin. Really interesting. It's interesting to hear that people have lost experiments or materials in that last phase of re-entry. Obviously, it makes sense, but you would, yeah, you would see that's a crucial step to solve for any sort of commercial commercially reliable service. And so, yeah, thank you for, for introducing that, Josh. Now, uh, at Satish, we're always interested in the commercial aspects of the technology. So I was hoping you could also give us some insights into the business side of things. I'm guessing that currently your primary competition is commercial and research access to the IS for microgravity testing. And uh, Yeah, it's a good question. Once upon a time, I would have said yes. Now, I think, I, I think actually the way that we found traction with our business has been much more with the material science expertise that we have at Space Forge, where we have had the big problem with the IS from a commercial perspective is it's not really commercial. The research that's conducted there is, in, is, is incredibly heavily subsidized, both by, it might be NASA or it might be ESA in Europe's case, or it might be national science funding bodies. So very little truly commercial activity actually occurs on the IS because of the nature of these. And many customers that access that say if it was not for the affordability created by some of these activities and these funding bodies, then they wouldn't actually continue with that microgravity research. What we're doing as Space Forge is the complete Forge Star vehicle operation. We're conventionally deployed like a satellite. We spend as much time in space as our customers need. Then we re-enter as and when and wherever we need to return to. Hence why we've established a return site in Australia. That allows us to actually serve a terrestrial research market for us, largely across next generation compound semiconductors and next generation pharmaceuticals with, with actually a commercial ethos first and quite frankly, a price point that those customers are willing to pay. Understood. Okay, brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. I know Jack is heavily involved in the, the research side of the work that's done on the ISS and the microgravity. But again, it's a space agency name, as you mentioned, you're looking more at the commercial market. So that, that sort of covers the existing competition, say, for Space Forge's service. And as you say, it's, it's probably that's so different that it's not competition at all. And obviously the ISS is on a clock as well. But there are these emerging concepts and emerging private space stations, Axiom Orbital Reef, there were a vast launch announced recently, all these sorts of things. The idea of Starship as well being something that stays in uh, near Earth's orbit, could be used to stay near Earth's orbit or somehow facilitate microgravity access. As well as then we look a bit further down the line to Lunar Gateway and access, more reliable, consistent access to cis-lunar space as well. There are, there are 
emerging potential opportunities for companies and people to to use microgravity. Do you see such developments as threats or opportunities for Space Forge? And how do you how would you differentiate yourself in that sort of market? Yeah, largely, I would see us as collaborators to those operators when it comes to the emerging space station market. I think the way that it will actually emerge is these space stations will have to have their own specializations in what they do. It cannot be a one size fits all approach. You can't have somebody staying at a space hotel and on the other side of that station be trying to manufacture next generation drugs. It just doesn't work. The, be- the One of the best reasons for going to space to manufacture in the first place is because you get away from humans. We tend to be <laughs> the worst thing in any manufacturing loop. And however, I think we have to be cautious about some of these initiatives because many will present the same problems that we have on the ISS. It's not if they're at a 400 kilometer altitude, then it's not high enough for a whole bunch of manufacturing processes. If they are, again, at a similar altitude, they're operating in an already contaminated environment from what's been left behind by the ISS. So we have to be cautious of that. When it comes to Cis Luna, I am somewhat of a contrarian because I I don't believe in the lunar economy. I think it's a false dichotomy to suggest that there's an economy there when it's entirely based upon government work and ambition. I don't deny the need to go before we can prove our steps before going to Mars. But I personally think that I prefer getting to look at the moon unspoiled before I think we start to see it strip mined and everything else. And there is a real, I think the real question we need to be asking ourselves about the cislunar economy and how that all works, not to say that the moon is also incredibly dusty and not good for manufacturing, but really I think we have an opportunity now to show as 21st century humanity that we've learned the lessons of history before we start expanding beyond this planet. Sorry, that was a little bit profound there, but (laughs) hopefully hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. That's, That's really interesting. Brilliant. Okay. Uh, Lloyd, I wanted to ask you some questions next. So this is the first time on the podcast that we've had an organization involved in the launch from the spaceport aspect. So it's really good to have this opportunity to quiz you. Now, as you launch vehicle manufacturers often grab the headlines around the world because they work so fundamental to every other aspect of the industry and highly visible. And some of them are quite famous, the <laughs> owners of these companies. And they run other businesses as well, and they've got a high profile. But the spaceport facility itself is what I'm really interested in talking about because it's a key, it's a key enabler, or could be a potential bottleneck for the growth of the industry. Now we've seen how difficult it is to develop different sites around the world, particularly for commercial first operations, and regulation and public perception play a huge role. Virgin Orbit at Cornwall, there was a bit of a backlash with the idea of Virgin Galactic being at Cornwall. I know in the local region, yeah, Josh, obviously all too familiar with the Virgin Orbit development there, unfortunately. But the recent Starship test, for example, has had a a huge, possibly unforeseen impact on the spaceport site on Starbase at Boca Chica. And how how are you dealing with these, these issues at Southern Launch? What factors come into play when you're trying to develop a really reliable and consistent service for commercial customers? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. And it ties in really strongly with the fact that Australia doesn't have ongoing, I'll say, even like military space launch capability. So we're coming at it from a very greenfields perspective, which is in some ways a, in some ways that's a really good position to be in. And in other ways, it's really bad. I'll start with the really bad. And uh, where it's bad is when people have misconceptions or the wrong ideas about what a returning capsule looks like or how it will behave or specifically the market that we here in Southern Lodge are actually going after, what we're trying to solve commercially. So a lot of people will look at Starship and go, oh, jeepers, that's actually going to be launching here in Australia. That's the type of, I'll say damage, that's the type of or the size of the rockets that that we as a nation are looking into, where in actual fact, our business market is, as you quite rightly pointed out, it's it's that bottleneck, and it's aimed squarely at those micro and small lift launch vehicles that are taking those bespoke payloads up to space. So they, they are the taxis of space launch. They're not the buses or the trains. Quite a defined market that you could say. And where it's been... 
that's been on the bad, right? And so that's meant that we've had to do a lot of explaining. We've had to do a lot of education. And so we, as a small company, we're relatively small. I think the stat is that in the last, so since we started, we've engaged with over 2,000 students around our state. We've gone to over 20 different schools to help spread the message about what Space Launch is and what it means for everyday people, not only in Australia, but around the world. So it's given us that great opportunity from that aspect. Where it's also been really good from a greenfields perspective is because we as a nation haven't done space, we've been able to be conscientious contributors into developing what, uh, what good looks like in space launch. So we've developed a really close relationship with both the Australian Space Agency, the Civil Aviation Safety Authority, all the stakeholders at all different levels to shape and influence how we should all work together to realize this new, new and exciting industry for Australia. So it's, it, and because everyone wants to see this happen, it's been really, I want to use the word empowering. So it's been really exciting. It's a better word than exciting to be involved in these discussions and see everybody bouncing off ideas so that we can make, make this something for Australia into the future. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. That's really interesting to hear your public um, public perception approach there with the students. I think it's, it is what's very interesting and both kind of a negative and a positive for you guys, but probably an overwhelming positive is that you, there isn't, as far as I understand, key linchpin, large-scale, publicly funded missions that you're facilitating. You, Australia is not going to the moon. And I'll say these things that have developed the industry and, the, well, all the space consciousness in different countries and have rallied people behind different areas but on the other hand in the current times that also means you get to get to dis discuss a message that is business first that isn't a huge amount of taxpayer money that's going on in the area yeah and it's meant that we are able to talk about things and josh alluded to it earlier around efficiency we cannot, we, we can't uh, do things at the scale that uh, some of the larger spacefaring nations do because they can throw a hundred people at it. We just cannot do that. It's allowed us to be, it's allowed us to pinpoint exactly what space launch and return in Australia looks like from a regulatory perspective and be very clear on being able to answer those questions which ultimately makes it cheaper for the commercial operators. That's it. Perfect. And this is a really key lesson, I think, that we come across all the time at Satchers because we work with space agencies all around the world facilitating procurement, etc. And space agencies and organizations and trade bodies and all sorts in different countries really need to tune their activities to the needs of their country and the market that they would like to serve, the market that they can actually facilitate and serve. And this is an example, a really good example of this, I think from Australia's point of view. And you mentioned there the regulators and obviously regulatory and assuming regulatory and resource issues could be worked out. They, they this is not a foregone conclusion, I'm assuming, when we can come to when we come to the re entry of the space asset. Utilizing the approaches that Lloyd, that, that sorry that Josh uh, laid out earlier or maybe alternative technology in the future. I'm really interested from both the technology and, and facilities perspective, what is required at the spaceport to enable the re-entry of materials, sensitive, potentially dangerous materials made in space, but as well as the regulatory issues. I'm guessing that there are parts of this that are a really tough sell for regulators. Maybe not. I'll speak, yeah, okay. I'll speak to the technology side part first. So first and foremost, I should very quickly say no dangerous materials are on board because outer space treaty and all of those things, we would contravene. So very much focused on things that are good for the planet. The, when it comes to the way that technology works because of its gentleness, we actually are operating uh, probably crudely in a non ballistic manner compared to other reentry vehicles. So we're actually much easier to track, much easier to work with, much easier to locate, which then also greatly reduces the amount of infrastructure and people we need on the ground to support that reentry operation because we don't need a boat with a big crane and naval and military deployments and all sorts to support it and protect the zone in which we're landing to. And that really eases our operational burden. And as Lloyd has mentioned, also helps us get the costs down. 
Other, otherwise, we would be, again, prohibitively expensive. I'll certainly let Lloyd cover why we're quite excited about the regulatory environment in Australia. I would say from a European perspective, there isn't a commercial company that's really done this. So we're operating as a business literally at the bleeding edge of regulation, which is not something I think people ever really talk about. But the regulation for what we do in terms of in-space manufacturing and re-entry simply doesn't exist. But that's also putting us into a real position of leadership that we are able then to work with both UK and European government on how to actually create the regulation to enable our operation to take place, but at the same time also create a standard of safe operation that any anybody that enters the market will also have to adhere to so that we can actually protect both the space that we're using in outer space and also the ranges we're looking to use here on Earth. Yeah, so how are these regulatory issues worked out in Australia? <laughs> What's the best way to tackle this? It's Returns in Australia are comparatively simple to launch right? because from uh, under the Australian regulations, they don't connect the return to a specific launch activity. So we don't have to, the Australian government doesn't have to approve a launch at a different location with, say, a Space Forge capsule on it to then be able to allow its return to come back to Australia. Rather, we can make a separate permit application for the specific activity. So that simplifies a lot of the workload there because all we then are working from is a, while the system's on orbit, this is where it's proposed to re-enter from. This is then the uh, anticipated safety exclusion zone and the protections that we'll put in place around that safety exclusion zone to make sure that no third-party persons or property are in that area. And so from a regulatory perspective, it's a, a lot easier than a launch. Because we are also operating, so these capsules are proposed to return into the Kinema test range, it's 145 kilometers long and as wide. There is no one living out there. There is no, no big highways, no big bits of infrastructure and the likes. And so from a regular, regulatory perspective, we will be returning a capsule into a location where there will be no one anyway. So safety, procedures, all of those things become a lot easier to communicate into the regulatory environment. And because we've got a very good track record of managing that area already, we are able to help expedite that whole approvals process. It, it's worth adding that that Kaniba test range is half the size of Wales. <laughs> Just to put into perspective <laughs> how big a space we're going to be operating in. <laughs> and uh, from memory, Josh, you don't need all of it either. <laughs> no, we need about 30 kilometers of the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, and look, well, that's about 12 rugby teams in Wales. One of the things that we're really proud about is that we work with the traditional owners of the land to help us go and recover components, capsules, parts of rockets and the likes that we launch out into what is national parks. These are the people who've lived there for generations and know how to navigate the land. So it's, it's a very nice relationship that we've developed with them that, uh, yeah, bringing potentially the world's oldest culture into what will be the newest technology frontier. Very exciting. Oh, fascinating. Yeah, obviously, the, that land, that volume of empty land is it's very difficult to replicate in pretty much any other country. So that makes sense. But, but so I understand the regulatory environment is such that you could receive the re-entry of materials from any mission launched from anywhere in the world. Correct, correct. At the moment, our orbital facility isn't yet up and running. Right here, right now, should the Space Forge want to return something to the Kineva test range, it'll have to have been launched from somewhere else. And the current examples is Australia's used by JAXA for the return of their Busa 1, Hayabusa 2, and in the not-too-distant future, MMX, so the first Mars return samples. 
Excellent. That, that versatility, flexibility is going to be vital for a commercial yes. industry. That makes sense. Okay, brilliant. So to, to Josh, following from that, assuming these regulatory and resourcing issues can be worked out, although it doesn't seem like they're issues as much as just just steps in the process. Why does Space Forge think that now is a good time to develop this sort of service? And they've technically been space re-entry capability since the days of the shuttle or possibly just before. But does it yeah, since Mercury, we've been able to come back from space in the late, late 1950s. Does the growth of the commercial industry mean that there's more potential customers who can take advantage of this service today? Yeah, certainly. A good way to think about it, I think, is the same sort of thing that aviation went through. If you think about the explosion of growth that's gone through in, what, little over, what, about 100 years now since first flight. I think the opportunity that we have is comparable to how much you can open up a market and equally how much you can impact people's lives in a positive sense. The critical things that have happened really is that launch price has come down. When we set up Space Forge in 2018, launch price was about 35k a kilogram, which was that meant we could, there were seven markets we felt we could produce something in space and return it and do so profitably. As launch prices have come down, that list has greatly expanded up to the point now there's over a hundred markets where you could produce something in space, have a positive benefit on Earth and conduct that activity profitably. The beauty of joining something like in-space manufacturing is that you're either at the right time or you're too early, but we're definitely not too late. And I think that's a really good position to be in as a startup. I would, however, also add that in-space manufacturing itself is not new. The first time we produced a semiconductor in space was 1974 aboard the US Skylab. That then transitioned into the shuttle in the uh, early and mid-90s. And then, of course, we had the permanent habitation of the International Space Station where research and experiments get done all the time. The balance we think that people are missing when it comes to how we actually make in-space manufacturing work for everybody on Earth, really come down to two aspects. The first of those is capacity. How are you doing enough of the manufacturing that it actually moves the needle to industries on the ground? And cadence, how do you have delivery of the material that you've produced enough times to enough locations that you can actually interact with the industries you're trying to serve? If we re if we can produce a ton, but we can only return it once a year, we're actually not really of great use to anybody because of the way that you know automotive, aerospace, telecom, all of these industries are set up pretty much with just-in-time manufacturing principles. To the extent where during the pandemic something got delayed for Jaguar Land Rover, and they chartered a helicopter to make sure that it still arrived on time, so that they didn't have to close the factory for a minute. Like that is how seamless your logistics need to be. So. When it comes to that why now expansion and one of the reasons again why we've done Australia so that we can get our product to customers as soon as possible in a time frame where they can use it. And at the same time, Lloyd mentions the establishment of the orbital facilities will become incredibly critical for us because that means once we've returned our products to Australia, we then don't need to bring the satellite back to the UK for refurbishment and then send it off to the US again we can actually set up our own sort of hub and spoke model of having refurbishment, relaunch and return loops in the markets that we're looking to serve. And Australia is really perfect for that. Excellent. Well, that makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of yeah, critical enablers lining up that can facilitate this. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. Now, and I guess just to finish up on that, when we talk about in-space manufacturing, you mentioned there's a potentially 100 market space force there uh, can, can financially access. But when it comes to this area, there's a lot of different materials and products that people discuss as potential use cases and a few examples, as you mentioned, okay, dating back several years, but a few examples that have successfully been fabricated. Things that can't be easily or cheaply made on earth for various different reasons. Which applications, I want this is to both of you, please, if you could mention, which applications do you think have real genuine commercial potential in, in the short to medium term future? And, and then more broadly, how do you see this segment of the industry playing out over the next, say, 10, 10 or so years? My favorite example, simply because it's the market we're operating in, is semiconductors. We, as, as a civilization, we've pushed silicon as far as it can go. It's cheap, it's plentiful, it's incredibly well commoditized. 
but we have effectively hit the limit of its potential. And that's because really when it comes to it, any anything you're doing, any system you're operating is entirely defined by the materials you're using to accomplish that task. The move into next generation compound semiconductors, gallium nitride, silicon carbide, indium phosphide, to name a few, are profound. They offer much better power efficiency, much better thermal conductivity, but they are much harder to produce on the ground than compared to silicon. Crudely, silicon, you basically have a vat of it and you pull it out of the vat and it's perfectly formed crystal. The others, you have to grow atomic layer by atomic layer. It's incredibly costly. It's profoundly affected by gravity and it requires an incredibly high purity vacuum. Now, of course, you get that high purity vacuum and that microgravity aspect by being in space. Where I think that's in it, That's critical is this isn't saying we're going to go to space and move all of industry away from Earth and produce in space forever. Where I think space will play a critical part is really becoming a keystone technology for each of the terrestrial manufacturing um, operations that we have. And semiconductors underpin absolutely everything we do. So to be able to play at that advanced material level and then see how that value translates into the end systems, whether or not it's in the plane you're flying, the way you get your 5G signal, or the way that you charge your electric car, that I think is critically where space can play. So really to sum that up, I guess my objective is to make in-space manufacturing boring. Excellent. (laughs) And Lloyd, I wondered if you had an answer as well on the potential applications. Look, it's it's an area outside of where we operate, but as the, the as a company that is, but as we've developed this relationship with Josh, so the applications that that he's looking to help support really excite us both as a company, me individual, it, as an individual, but then I'd be saying even as a species here on Earth, because our resources are finite, and if we if Josh and his team can crack this nut. It'll start to unlock uh, and so, hopefully solve some of the problems that we will be facing in the not too distant future. But very importantly, our kids and their kids well into the future, things like climate change. How do we make things more efficient? How do we understand the environment that we're operating in better to manage our emissions, to be more efficient in how we produce different foods and the likes. And I think that what Josh and his company are doing are an incredibly important step to making that a reality. We're very excited to support him and his company in what they're doing and playing just a very small part in what is a very complex process. So, yeah, we're looking forward to it. Josh, make it happen. Easy. That's the easy bit. (laughs) And I guess from the spaceport perspective, the this is where this, the specialization of technologies for space means that the airport analogy, I think, falls down quite quickly. So especially when you're talking about something like in-space manufacturing. So you've got to facilitate the launch or the testing integration, the launch of the system, the re-entry, but then potentially refabrication and extraction of the materials and products and stuff like that. That's, okay, handled by a space forge or potentially several companies, but they all facilitated on your premises primarily, at least initially. Australia hasn't had a lot of high-tech manufacturing. We used to have a car industry here. We've got a very vibrant defense industry, and we're about to go working in the nuclear submarine uh, take, but we're late entrant. So being able to attract and then retain a core capability like the return of in-space manufacturing helps to enable the development of that local industry. So while it might not be, I'll say, directly related to Southern Launch and what we're doing, it will enable the growth of a far broader funnel of industries that will ultimately benefit us. Forgetting that the pure commercials from our perspective, yes, more launches, more returns, more return for our stakeholders, sorry, our shareholders, but very importantly, it makes the broader industry around our spaceports far more resilient, which will end up making us more resilient. Excellent. I think that's a great place to wrap up. And uh, yeah, I think from my perspective, from the point of view of the overall space industry and uh, the marketplace, I would say best of luck to you both, because what we're discussing here is the potential for a huge amount of 
new applications, new technologies, new companies, new use cases, new business models in operation in different ways in all bits. I think it would be great to see see what happens next. And yeah, we'd like to thank both of you for being here on the podcast today, for spending time with the Space Industry Podcast community. I wondered if you could just quickly say how people can find out more about your each of your work and how to follow you, etc. Yeah, Josh, you from me. Yeah, sure. Spaceforce.com. We're on Twitter, LinkedIn, all the usual so- socials. Our Twitter team's getting pretty edgy. They're beginning to toy around with memes. So I'm getting quite excited about that. With the, just the pure millennial in me. So again, thank you so much for having us. Really enjoy this. And I think I never thought I'd be spending so much time with a chap in Australia when I set this up. And yeah, <laughs> Lloyd and I are now speaking almost daily. I think that's just testament to how big this industry is and how wonderful a place it is to work. And likewise, thanks so much for having us this evening. It's approaching dinner time here in Australia. People want to reach out. To, so our website is slightly different. So we are at southernlaunch.space, S P A C E. There's a whole bunch of buttons at the bottom of the page that people can click and contact contact us by email and the likes as well. So please reach out, ask questions. We've got a bunch of information on our website. We are looking forward to questions when they come through. Great. Thank you both. And we'll include those links in the show notes for everybody. And finally, to our listeners, thank you very much for spending time with us on the Space Industry Podcast today. I hope you found this conversation with Josh and Lloyd really useful and very interesting to learn about this emerging aspect of the industry. But as I say, not as far away as perhaps you might think. Thank you very much and all the best. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Space Industry by SatSearch. I hope you enjoyed today's story about one of the companies taking us into orbit. We'll be back soon with more in-depth, behind-the-scenes insights from private space businesses. In the meantime, you can go to satsearch.com for more information on the space industry today or find us on social media if you have any questions or comments. To stay up to date, please subscribe to our weekly newsletter and you can also get each podcast on demand on iTunes, Spotify, the Google Play Store or whichever podcast service you typically use.